Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality could be personal sin, mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the procedure from getting out of carnality and back to spirituality so that the Holy Spirit can teach and recall Bible doctrine according to Jesus' testimony in John 14, 26. I give you a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us the Christmas story. Maybe a different view on it. With the subject matter of before Mary and Joseph came together, i.e. husband and wife, she was found to be with child. Ooh, what a problem they had. Until it was revealed to Joseph that it was of the Holy Spirit. Now we have a miraculous conception of a virgin. And boy, has that caused controversy over the years, Father. <clears throat> but it is truth, and truth always separates us. Pray the Holy Spirit would reveal the truth about it today in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Give everybody a chance to get their food. Now, you can eat while I teach, okay, so that we'll all get out of here at 1230. I will put John, <coughs> Don. You're in charge of getting me out of here at 1230. I, I'm using one text today, that's Matthew 118, because there's a, a phrase in there that's really important. I think sometimes people miss this little phrase, which is really important theologically, before they came together. Now here's what it says out of Matthew 118. And if you have a New American Standard Bible, it's going to say it. If you have a King James Bible, it's going to say it. If you have an NIV Bible, it's going to say it. They're going to say the same thing before they came together. Here's how it reads, Matthew 118. I read from the New American. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now look, there's a really important part here as far as the Bible is concerned. She was found to be pregnant. That's pretty obvious. Because when she came back from Elizabeth, visiting Elizabeth, she was three months pregnant. She was found to be, now what's important, she was found to be with child, but here's what they discovered by the Holy Spirit. What they, what they discovered wasn't that she was just pregnant. What they discovered that she was pregnant by means of the Holy Spirit. That's really important. Now here's the phrase, before they came together. Before they became man and wife and consummated it sexually, she was found to be with child three months before they got married. And boy, has that caused a storm. When I was at college at Western Michigan, I had a biology freshman my freshman year who stormed on this idea as a biologist. He was an atheist, but he stormed on this idea that how could anybody in their right mind believe that? Because this was medically impossible. <laughs> medically impossible. When I got into theology training in my theology school, I had a professor that believed it was a myth. A myth. Later in my life, as I grew spiritually, I realized that the first professor I had was more truthful than the second one. The first man declared himself, my first professor declared himself to be an atheist, and from her, his standpoint of biology, this was an impossibility, and he said so and gave his reasons. The professor of theology led everybody astray 
because he, he claimed to be a believer, not an unbeliever, and declared that, in his opinion, this was a myth. Wonderful thing about that, both of these men, is that the tr you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so over the course of my life, this has been a very important issue in my life. Matthew 1.18. Matthew 1.18. Notice I gave you a couple I, things that are important that you may not know in the English language. For example, <clears throat> the word before. It's a Greek word prim. It's a, it's a, it's a rare conjunction. It's a conjunction before. And it's in the Greek language, they call it a temporal. And it's always used this way before. And it's a conjunction of timing. In other words, when you see this word, it's always translated, prim is always translated before, and it's always dealing with a timing of some event. A timing. Now, the event that this word's attached to is before they came together. Now, the they is Joseph and Mary in the story. The they is Joseph and Mary. The coming together, the coming together is the consummation of their marriage before they had sexual relations as a husband and wife. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. That is really important because Joseph married her on that basis having this revealed. See, the story of Joseph's encounter with this information is Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Mary's information comes from Luke 1, 26 through 38. These are the two, Mary, Mary's encounter and Joseph's encounter. Gabriel was sent to both of these. Gabriel is the archangel teacher of Messiah in the Bible. Gabriel, everybody thinks he blows a horn. But he's probably one of the great, great teachers of all times of Messiah. When he shows up, something big about Messiah is important in human history. And the birth story, he's all over the birth story. You read Matthew 1 and 2, uh, 3. You read Luke 1 and 2. He's all over it. Gabriel, he is the master teacher of the word of God on the Messiah. And he shows up. And explains to Mary in Luke 134, 31 through 35. But he shows up, the teaching angel, to Mary. And he tells her that what he's about to explain to her is going to seem impossible. For example, in ver in, when, he said, in, when he tells Mary she's going to conceive and have a baby, she goes like, I don't see how that's possible since I'm a virgin. Well, he explains to her how it's going to happen in Luke. The Holy Spirit, you're going to, the, the power of the Most High is over, overshadow you and you will conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit and you will have a son and, and, and we will call his name Emmanuel or, or, or God with us or as he says to Mary, the Son of God. Now, what he told Mary is that what I'm going to tell you and what you're going to th go through is going to seem humanly impossible. In all of the natural mind and all of the human experiences, this is going to seem impossible. And he tells her, but Mary, you know as a spiritual person that Anything that God tells you is possible. And when he tells you something's possible, then what's impossible is overridden by that idea. Now listen to me. That's the idea behind miracles. Miracles defy the law of natural order. The blind man of John 9, from birth, no eyes, is given sight. He reversed the in order of natural creative order. That's what God does. That's, that's a miracle, and that's what God does. 
when it says with man, what is impossible with man? He told this to, uh, to Sarah. Sarah, when she was told that past menopause, she was going to have a baby, she laughed. She went, huh. Right? Now, some of us might have cried. Right? But she was way past even thinking that she could cry over it. That was just funny at 90. That was just pure funny. So God said to her, with God, nothing is impossible. He said, nothing, nothing is impossible. What, is, what seems to be difficult for man is not difficult for God. And you know that. We all know that, do we not know that? <clears throat> Except when it comes to our life. When it knocks on our door, then we drop into all the impossibilities before we drop into probabilities. Look, in man, the impossibles are impossibles. But with God, the impossibles are possible, listen, according to the word of God. Do you know what Mary said when the, when the angel got through explaining, Gabriel got through explaining to her how this was going to take place? She said, your bond slave agrees. He called it, she called herself a bond slave. Be it, un, be it done unto me, verse 38, be it done unto me according to your word. It is according to your word that God changes the impossibilities of your life into the possibilities of your life. Because, listen, write this verse down on your paper. Romans 4, 21. Romans 4, 21 is a key verse to this. What God has promised, whatever God has promised according to his word, whatever God has promised according to his word, he is able to, and will bring it to completion. The performance is with God. The promise is with you. The performance was with God. Here's the key, is your faith. Will you believe the promise so that it can be performed? You see? One more time. What he's promised, he is able and willing to perform. What stands between promise and performance is your faith. Faith in God's promise. Now, what are you trusting in God's faith, in God's promise? His character. You're, you're believing that God is able and willing and capable of doing what he's promised to you. And see, that's where the rubber hits the pavement. There's where the difficulty is. Because I don't have a no, I have more month than I have money. What am I going to do? I mean, what answer does he have for you? Well, he might suggest ways to tighten up your belt, not to spend what you don't have. There might be a lot of lessons in it, but it doesn't feed you today, right? Too much month for my money. So there's a lesson to be taught you, but listen, there's a promise to be given to you. There are certainly lessons in that. Would you agree? that need to be taught. But what is my promise? My promise is that he'll feed me every day. Is that not a promise? Oh, well, wait a minute. The great prayer of Matthew 6, the great prayer of Jesus, when he says, teach me to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, our daily bread. Is that a promise? Jesus, when he gets later to explain that idea of a promise, he says, well, when you begin to doubt God, go out and look at the animal kingdom because they depend on him every day. They trust him every day. Look at the birds and listen. They sing every day for his, to, to him. They sing every day. He gives them food every day and they sing every day. They fly around and they're happy. You know why? Because God takes care of them and they're content. We need to learn that lesson. This is the lesson that Mary is trying to give testimony to, to your lives today. So I'm, I'm interested in discussing this possibility before they came together. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. I got three points for you today, and, and we'll get out of here. 
Here's what people miss in this story. Both my professor at Western Michigan of biology and my other professor of theology who said it was a myth. Here's what they missed. They missed the fall of Adam. Both these men missed the fall of Adam. I can't begin to tell you the fall of Adam, how important it is to your life. Your life. Your life. The fall of Adam, which took place in Genesis 2 through 4, for discussion, not, not today, but for your reading, he says to, you know this story, most of you, in the Garden of Eden, he says, of all the trees of the garden you can freely eat, but, not, but there's one. There's one tree in the middle of the garden called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat from that tree. For in the day you eat from that tree, listen to what he said in the Hebrew. He said, muth, muth. He said, dying, you will die. The word muth, muth is the word death in Hebrew, and he used it twice, meaning there would be a double death. There would be a spiritual death, separation from God in time, and there would be a spiritual death, separated from God in eternity. We know as we read the story on that when they ate of the fruit of the tree, that they, they were separated from God. They hid from him. They wanted nothing to do with it. They were separated from him. And by sacrifice, by animal sacrifice, by blood atonement, they were brought back into fellowship with him as, as we go into chapter threes, 3 and 4. You see, fall of Adam. The fall of Adam involves two deaths. There's a spiritual death at birth. There's a physical death. There's a, a, a second death at death. When you're born, you're born spiritually separated from God. And when you die, if without faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're separating him, they call it in Revelation, the 20th chapter, they call it the second death. The second spiritual death that's separated from God in eternity. Where did all that happen? All of this happens to the human race. When did it begin? Genesis 2.17 through the third chapter of Genesis 1 through 7 when Adam and Eve ate of the tree. So that's the fall of Adam. And here's what the fall of Adam establishes. It established the human genetic pattern of natural copulation. The fall of Adam. You say, holy mackerel. See, my biology teacher didn't know that. And my theology teacher didn't believe it. Now I'm going to say it again because you missed it. The fall of Adam, which took place in Genesis 2 and 3, the fall of Adam established the human genetic pattern of natural copulation. Conception. You know, conception. That's why the book of Genesis the word Genesis is a Greek word for a Hebrew book <laughs> because of the Septuagint. It means beginnings or origins. I don't think sometimes you read Genesis and realize how it applies to your own life today. It's a 21st century book because it deals with origins. Where did things originally begin? That's the wonder of the book of Genesis. In natural conception, the father, this is important, the father... In natural conception, like goes on today, in natural conception, the father is the sexual transmitter of Adam's original sin and his sin nature. Genesis 2, 17, 3, 1 through 7. Listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. As in Adam, we're all born in Adam. We're members of the human race. In Adam, all die, talking spiritually. See, that's at, that's at Genesis 2.17. So also, see the word as, and see the word so also. Those are enormously connected. I put them in bold print. People read through that, and they don't pay attention. In the Greek language, when you have the word as, and then you have the word so as, they're connected. That's a connective link. For in Adam all die spiritually, so also in Christ, all will be made alive spiritually. Now here's what you have. Everybody's born in the natural state. That's in Adam, spiritually dead. You have to be born again, Nicodemus. You must be born again to 
see and enter the kingdom of God. That's called being born again, born from above, or spiritual birth. Do you know what's in between these two? In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says, you have a first Adam and you have a last Adam. The first Adam got us into trouble. The last Adam will deliver us from it. The first Adam got us into Adam's sin. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, will get us out of it. So here's, here's what sets between the first Adam, the spiritual death, spiritual death at birth, and spiritual life is Jesus Christ. The birth of Jesus Christ and him qualifying to go to the cross impeccable he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It is Jesus Christ that separates that, that brings that whole idea together theologically. In Adam, all die. Is it some or all? 1 Corinthians, <laughs> all means all. Uh, it all means some. Every member of the human race is born in Adam, spiritually separated from God. And the only way back, listen, Jesus said it in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What? No man comes to the Father except through me. I mean, how important is the birth of Jesus Christ to get us out of Adam and get us into Christ? It's essential. And what was essential about it is that his birth has to be unique to be qualified to be the savior of the world. And I'm going to tell you why. In natural copulation, the male sperm is blemished by Adam's original sin. This is what people do not understand because they're, maybe their theological teaching is based on my professors of myth and don't go into it. In natural copulation, the male sperm, as it is today, is blemished by Adam's original sin. In natural conception, the mother is the sexual carrier of the, not transmitter, carrier. I can't begin to tell you how, if you read Genesis 2 and 3, it'll teach you that. I'm not talking about, I don't have enough time in this one hour, but beginning the new year, I'm going to teach Genesis, I'm going to teach you all this stuff, okay? But right now, you know, I'm just telling you the way it is. In natural conception, the mother is the sexual carrier. The male is the transmitter, and the mother is the carrier. Now, you all know the mother is the carrier, don't you? I mean, she gets, it gets pretty obvious after a while that she's the carrier. Therefore, Mary is the carrier. Listen to me. But Joseph is not the transmitter, right? And see, there's the miracle. This is not a natural conception. Or else Jesus can't go to the cross. If Joseph is his father, Jesus can't go to the cross and deliver people from Adam's sin because he's part of it. Please, people, please understand that. There's such, there's such ignorance about this today. The old school knew this stuff. New school doesn't. Therefore, Jesus, Jesus is born outside outside the slave market of Adam's sin. He is born by the word of God. He is born the only begotten son of God. Joseph is not the father, could never be the father, because that could never happen. God has to be absolutely 100% his father. I gave you passages. You know John 3.16? Ah, but do you know John 3.16? Do you know the key phrase in there? Only begotten Son of God. And we quote that. We miss some of the dynamite in it. Prior to the fall of Adam, Prior to the fall of Adam, according to the Bible, <coughs> copulation was recreational, but the promise was procreational. You can read that in Genesis 1.28 and discover more about it in Genesis 3.13-16. through 16. Listen, next Wednesday, bring a friend. 
right? Bring a friend. We'll feed you, and let, let, me, let me teach you a little bit about the Christmas story you may never hear. Point number two. Since the fall of Adam, every member of the human race is born under Adam's original sin. That's what Paul has talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and 45. Born Every human me, me, person is born under. That means that every person born as a human being is born under the slave market of sin. That's where he's born. That, you say, I say to you, where were you born? You say Alabama. Where in Alabama? You give me the city. You're born in a home or a hospital. That tell me your age. Right? <laughs> we're born in a home or a hospital. Right? I was born in Michigan, I was born in Whitehall, and I was born upstairs above a pharmacy. Think about that. I was born in a, in a, a, a store, <laughs> uh, apartment. Yeah. But I was born in Adam's sin, to tell you the truth. I was born in Adam's sin. It don't matter where I was born, I was born in Adam's sin. I don't care if you're in Alabama or Michigan or above a store or in a hospital. Uh, that's the way you're born. Every member of the human race is born with 13 judicial charges. If, if you don't have a pamphlet on that, well, you can probably pick up one. A 13 judicial charges, that is said, for example, everybody's born dead, alienated. Uh, you know, there's a whole list. I'm just dealing with spiritual death right here and spiritual birth. Every member of the human race is born under 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin with an old sin nature. If you want to read about your sin nature, <laughs> If you really want to read about it, it might scare you a little bit, but you ought to read Romans 6, 7, and 8. People go, where do you get there's a sin nature? Well, if, if I lived with you probably a day and a half, we'd both know we had one. <laughs> we'd probably both know it. But listen to this. Here's Romans 5, 12 on your paper. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. What's that sin? That's Adam's sin. Adam's sin, not mine, his. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered to the world, and death, spiritual death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. The death that spread to all men is one spiritually and one physically. What comes first? Spiritual. Spiritual death first. Now you have an opportunity to reverse that. You can, spiritual death can be removed to your life the moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead on the third day. That's called the gospel. That's called the gospel. It's, listen, the gospel is not that you believe Jesus existed or that he was a good man or he did miracles. The gospel is that he died for your sins, your sins in Adam, and the personal sins you will commit beyond that as a believer, that he died and took care of all of them, one death for all sin, was buried on third day, raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. Don't let people cheat you out of this truth. That's the, most, that's the greatest Christmas gift you could ever have in your life, the information I'm giving you this year. Death, and so death spread to all men. Watch this. Because what? Because all what? And say some? Ah. Now look, we either believe God wrote the Bible or he didn't. I personally believe he wrote it. I believe it's the word of God, written by man, by God. See, that's the first, that's the first barrier you've got to jump over. But it says, because all of what? Sin. Now watch this. Watch the pattern. Through one man sinner into the world. That's John 3.16, you know. Wait a minute. You just quoted. I saw every one of you quote John 3.16 in your head. For God so what? What, what? The what? Ah, come on now. He loved the world. And, and who's that? He's talking about people, isn't he? He's talking about people. And he's talking about the importance of his only begotten son's connection to all these people of the world. But you know why? Because they're all spiritually dead people. They're all spiritually dead through Adam's sin. And they've got to be born again. They've got to be born again. And that's the Christmas story. If there's ever a Christmas story, it's about why Christ was born, to die for those who have been born, who need to be reborn. Come on. 
there's the, there's the nativity scene and the importance of the message. Because here's the one man's sin entered in a death, create, created death, was spread to all men. And this combination theologically is because all, all, because all sinned. That's why they're called, listen, that's why they're called sinners. They're not sinners because they sin. They sin because they're sinners. And that's a status you have, one of the 13 judicial statuses you have in Adam that you don't have in Christ because he takes away the sinner part and puts the saint part in. I gave you other passages to read. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.16. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Now, I want you to circle that in your paper because you missed it. I, I want to be a good teacher to your life. See the word trustworthy? Circle that. See the word deserving full acceptance? You see, there's a condition here. Now, I'm going to tell you what he, what he said. Here's what he said. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I'm foremost. See, we're all foremost. We're sinners far foremost. We're all there. There are none that are not, except one, the person Jesus Christ. But listen, here's your problem. Now listen to me. Here's your problem. Is it a trustworthy statement? And deserving full acceptance? Because if it isn't, this has been a futile trip. Listen to what he says. It is a trustworthy statement. Trustworthy. Deserving full acceptance. You know what that is? Listen to me. That's volition. Now, you don't have to do that, right? You don't have to believe any of this stuff. You don't have to believe any of it. But it's a trustworthy statement, and it deserves full acceptance. That's volition. That's free will. You have a right to believe it or not to believe it. You have a right to accept Christ as your Savior. You have a right to reject him. But there's consequences to, the, to, to your choices, are there not? Have you learned nothing by this time in your life that there are consequences to your choices? Why would this be a difficult for you when it comes straight from the word of God? I, you know, those aren't my words, are they? I, I didn't make those words up. Your Bible will say the same thing. I didn't make them up. Now, let me, cl let me, let me close this out. Point number three, Mary's egg. Now, we're talking about procreational ideas here. Mary's egg. We're not talking about breakfast. <laughs> right. Mary's egg was fertilized. Watch this now. Here's where I'm bringing back to where I started. Mary's egg was fertilized outside the natural copulation by divine design, by, de by decree and design. Do you understand that? That's a wonderful idea. You know where you find this information? Genesis 3.15. When he said to the serpent, which was Satan, here's your deal. And he, and, he, and he gave a prophecy of the seed of the woman versus the seed, the woman's seed. And, he said, and the, the woman's seed is Christ. He's going to crush your head. One day he will crush your head. And so it will. you know what we call that? You know what we call Genesis 3.15 about crushing the head? We call that eschatology. We call that the teachings on the second coming of Christ. It, listen, that was taught and introduced in Genesis 3.15, the book of origins or beginnings. Isn't that interesting? Isaiah 7.14, the prophecy of the virgin, the woman. See, we're told a woman, a woman is going to produce the Messiah. Every time you go to a genealogy, you got men. Except Matthew. Ah, oh, wonderful Matthew. 
put five women in the genealogy to connect it to Genesis 3.15. Oh, boy. Well, Isaiah 7, 14, uh, it says that a virgin, and, and listen, that was the one that Gabriel pulled up and gave to Joseph that cleared it up in Joseph's heart. Joseph said, yeah, I'll marry her. So I gave you those passages. Listen to Matthew 1, 20. Uh, Gabriel says, Joseph, son of David. So that's genealogy. He wasn't really the son of David. That's genealogy. I mean, he's the son of the genealogy of David. He's of the house of David. That's why he married Joseph, went to Bethlehem, right? To fulfill Messianic prophecy. Joseph, Joseph, son of David. What a wonderful that was. I mean, he connected him to the birth story of the Messiah when he said son of David. He didn't give him the son of Barjona or something like that when he says to Peter, Peter, son of Barjona. He said, Joseph, son of David, go back and reflect on the, where the history of the Messiah is supposed to come from. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to, to take Mary as your wife because, the word for means because, this is because the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. You know what Joseph did? He went ahead with his wedding. He went ahead with his wedding. And listen, he was so overwhelmed by this that he never had sexual relationships with Mary after they were married, according, according to, to Matthew, until after she was born, after he, until Messiah was born. And listen, the Bible, listen, the Bible never instructs him to do that. God never instructed him to do that. He did that out of respect. And then they went on to have a, a house full of kids, like a lot of us, a house full of them. Now watch this. As a female, a lot of you in here are females. As a female, Mary was a carrier, not a transmitter. Do you understand that? That's really important. As a female carrier, Mary's egg was unblemished. Just like yours. Therefore, the Holy Spirit could fertilize Mary's unblemished egg and produce Emmanuel, God with us, the only begotten Son of God. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Emmanuel is a name describing the theology of hypostatic union, that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man and one unique member of the human race. Boy, if they thought the virgin conception was hard to grasp, try to grasp that one. What that means in theology, that Jesus Christ is undiminished deity and true humanity and one unique person called Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his love towards us, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love towards us in, towards us. See, sometime write your name in there because your name is there. God demonstrated his own love towards us. Your name, mine is Ron. In that while we were yet sinners, name, Ron. Christ died for us, Ron. And Ron agrees. God demonstrated his love towards me in that while we, all mankind, were sinners for me, Christ died for me. Christ died for me. While we were all sinners, Christ died for me. You see, see what that means is personal. You, you, listen, it's not that your mother believed it or your daddy believed it or your preacher prepped person in your family. Seems like everybody in the South has some preacher in their family. But do you believe that this child born in a manger who was called by everybody, Jesus the Christ, is the Savior of the world? If he is, then he ought to be the Savior of you. He is the Savior of the world. But listen, is he your Savior? That's a choice you have to make. He died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. 
I want to show you one final thing and then we'll close. He made, it says, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says God made him, Christ, his son, who knew no sin. I want you to circle that. He's going to say this twice. This is important. God made him, Jesus Christ, his son, who knew no sin. No sin. In other words, he was born outside the slave market of Adam's sin. Agreed? It was a miraculous conception. Now, listen, it's a trustworthy statement and it deserves full acceptance, but that's up to you. That's one. He made him who knew no sin, that we call that in theology, impeccable. Impeccable. You know, it's one thing to be born the way he was born, but he spent, he spent over 30 years never committing a sin against God. That's impeccable. He who knew no sin, never personally committed it. What? Here's the second one. Circle the second word sin. Watch this. To be sin. Right there. He who knew no sin, not one iota of it, God made him to be sin on whose behalf? Ours. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, that's grace. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. The boast doesn't go to you. The boast goes to God. You see that? Pay attention to the word twice because there's the theology of the impeccability of Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for me. Okay? All right. Well, thank you for coming our way. Let me close in a word of prayer. We, we on schedule, ain't we, Don? Yeah. That's a whole lot of information. Your, your brain will hurt. Just <laughs> let it go. Bring a friend. I'll tell you something more about the Christmas story you may not know and haven't heard. Okay? Bring a friend. We, we got 12 more seats. Let's fill it up. 12 more seats. I want to feed you. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us, to celebrate the birth of Christ and to understand the origins, <clears throat> the origin of it and why it was so important for him to be born like in Galatians 4, 4, at the proper time, or Romans 5, 6, at the proper time in the plan of God, in the proper time. And here we are in the proper time. We took off a, a schedule to grab a quick lunch and go back to our workplace, re refueled and refreshed with what Christmas, the origin of it, what it's all about. Is it just about a baby born in a manger? Oh, it's so much more than that. But it has to start there. It is the origin uh, that goes back all the way to Adam and Eve. And so, Father, we thank you for these that have come our way today. We, we uh, pray they will come back and, and spend one more Christmas lunch with us. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.